LinkedIn presents. I'm Rufus Griscom. And I'm Caleb Bissinger. And this is The Next Big Idea. Today, how a journey into the bowels of the art world taught journalist Bianca Bosker how to see. My first job after college was at Christie's, the auction house. It was something of an odd choice. I'd majored in English, not art history. In fact, my familiarity with the art historical canon was so cursory that I kept a document in my desk called How to Pronounce Famous Artists' Names. But I was drawn to the glamour of the art world, the opulence. And to tell you the truth, it was glamorous. I wore a suit every day. I was welcomed into the grand homes of prominent collectors, where I had the rather surreal experience of seeing works by masters like Rauschenberg and Rothko and Richter, I think I pronounced those right, hanging nonchalantly on living room walls. Also, one time I bumped into Leonardo DiCaprio, like literally collided with him. So that was pretty cool. But the longer I spent in the art world, the more convinced I became that I would never really fit in. I wasn't debonair enough. I wasn't European. I'd never be one of the cool kids, the chosen ones, the bon vivants par excellence. So I quit. That was almost 10 years ago, and I haven't really looked back, but I have been thinking a lot lately about my layover in the art world, thanks to a brilliant new book, a New York Times bestseller, by journalist Bianca Bosker. It's called Get the Picture, a mind-bending journey among the inspired artists and obsessive art fiends who taught me how to see. Bianca worked at galleries, as an artist assistant, even as a museum security guard, trying to understand not just how the art world operates, but why art tickles our gray matter, why it touches our souls, why it matters. Like me, she often felt like an unwelcomed guest who'd wandered into a private party by mistake. A party, she writes, where pretension hung in the air like an unacknowledged fart. Unlike me, she stuck it out, obsessively working to push past the pretension so she could understand why so many people devote so much time and energy and money to something with no obvious practical value. I think her book would be worth reading, even if it was only a fly-on-the-wall account of the New York art scene. But Bianca offers us more than that. She goes deep on the growing body of sociological, neurological, and psychological research that aims to understand why humans have been making art since forever, and what looking at art does to our brains. The conclusions she draws have had a huge impact on me. In just the last few days, I've been looking at and learning from and appreciating art in new ways. And I've been seeing art in new places, which is to say, all around me. So even if you're one of those people who says that you don't get art, even if the thought of going to a gallery or a museum causes you to break out in hives, I'm here to tell you that art can have a profound impact on your mind, your body, on your soul. You just have to learn how to see. Coming up, Bianca is going to teach you how to do just that. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. Bianca Bosker, welcome to The Next Big Idea. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to start by asking you to read a passage from from your new book, Get the Picture. Partly, I, I want to just give listeners a sense of what a great writer you are. I also want to give them a sense of what this book is all about. So I wonder if you can read the, the final paragraph of the introduction. With great pleasure. Thank you. All right, here we go. 
What I did do over a period of several years is disown my normal life and discover just how messy fine art can be. I attached myself to brush nerds, color lovers, eyes, heads, and artist groupies, and learned what keeps them up at night. I bled over canvases, lost patches of skin to a sculpture, and let a nearly naked stranger sit on my face in the name of art. I worked as a museum guard protecting a pile of dust and learned why scientists call art a biologically essential tool. I got drugged, dared, shamed, shushed, and befriended by art obsessives who treat paintings like vital organs and know how to find beauty where we least expect it. In the process, I discovered another existence, one where the act of looking is an adventure. So Bianca, why did you decide to disown your life and venture out into the art world? Well, I have to confess that for a long time, Art and I were not on speaking terms. Mm. Um, Going to galleries and museums reliably made me feel like I was at least two tattoos and a master's degree away from figuring out what was going on. You know, you go into one of these like impeccably appointed rooms with their like flawless white walls and intense lighting. And, you know, you turn this corner and, and you find a bunch of people silently contemplating a sculpture of, like, decaying vegetables on a stained mattress. And you think, or I thought, you know, like, okay, everyone gets the punchline except me. And art had been a passion of mine growing up, but I have to confess that as an adult, I was intimidated. I felt alienated, and I sort of took the coward's way out and withdrew. Hmm. But then I started trying to reconnect with art. I started going back to galleries and museums, and I began to be consumed with this worry that by turning my back on art, I was missing out on something big. I am someone who is obsessed with obsession. And really, the passion of these art fiends drew me in. I'd never met a group of people willing to sacrifice so much for something of so little obvious practical value. You know, gallerists who max out credit cards to show hunks of deformed metal they swear will change the world, artists who, you know, scrimp on rent so their paintings can live better than they do. I mean, they wake up on a friend's couch covered in cat pee. And I was really surprised to discover that scientists are right there with artists in insisting that art is a fundamental part of our humanity, as one biologist puts it, as necessary to us as food or sex. So I was really bothered by this idea that I didn't understand how to engage with art. You know, these art lovers acted like they'd accessed this trap door in their brains. They had this expansive approach to life that made my own existence feel claustrophobic by comparison. And I just became fixated on whether I could see art and whether I could see the world the way they did and what would change if I could. And so I decided, much to a lot of people's chagrin, that I would try and throw myself into the nerve center of the fine art world and see what I learned. Talk a little bit about that chagrin, because as you start knocking on doors, they get slammed in your face, don't they? Yes, that's definitely an accurate way to put it. Um, I did start reaching out to art experts, you know, hoping to get answers to what I thought were rather fundamental questions like, how do you do art? Why does this matter? You know, why are you so passionate about this? And to my surprise, instead of answers, I got threats, warnings, you know, people who told me that what I wanted to do was impossible, if not Mm. vaguely dangerous. And I have to say, this was a big surprise to me. And maybe I was naive, but based on everything that the art world advertised about itself, I thought I would find this group of open-minded, free thinkers who wanted to embrace as many people in the warm hug of art. And it wasn't until I eventually actually started working at galleries that I realized how misguided that expectation was. Um, I think that there is this strategic snobbery that exists Mm. in the art world. There is this actually deliberate attempt to, in many cases, keep people out. Uh, It's no coincidence that I ended up working for a dealer who referred to the general public as Joe Schmoes. So yeah, there there really was this, this secrecy. I mean, nothing really prepared me for how hard it would be to get access. I felt like an FBI agent trying to get in with the mob. You alluded a second ago to the to the dealer who referred to non-art world denizens as schmoes. And this is a dealer you meet sort of in your first waypoint on this journey. You end up getting a gig at this gallery called 315 in Brooklyn. And I mean, to keep those schmoes out, this this dealer, his name is Jack, has basically like built the gallery on the second floor of a nondescript building. There's very little signage. Tell us how you ended up there and what you started learning about the art world once you got immersed at that particular gallery. 
Yeah. So I was very lucky to find that gallery. It was this very cool up and coming gallery in Brooklyn that worked with emerging artists, which is sort of art speak for artists that you've never heard of and may never hear of. And I was particularly drawn to this up and coming emerging side of the art world because I think that is the highest stakes and least covered part of the art world. Like that's where you see the first draft of history trying to be written. Now, I will say that, you know, as I started working at this gallery, you know, I was spackling walls and writing press releases. As you alluded to, I began to be initiated into all of these techniques that are used by the art world to keep the rest of us at arm's length. Mm -hmm. So where you put your gallery is a big one. Um, A lot of galleries are located less like stores than speakeasies. You know, they're hidden on second or third floors in buildings that could just as easily house apartments. I worked with a dealer who said that a storefront space was actively undesirable because then you have to deal with, and I quote, random ass people walking in. (laughs) Um, I was myself a liability. My boss quickly made clear that I needed a makeover. Um, As he put it to Mm -hmm. me one afternoon, you're not the coolest cat in the art world. So having you around, it's just like lowering my coolness. So he suggested, you know, wardrobe, severe haircut, no jewelry. I was advised to tone down my superficial enthusiasm. As you may know from your own travels in the art world, art connoisseurs basically exclusively discuss art in this really flat, affectless monotone that makes them sound like they're running out of batteries. <laughs> uh, the way I spoke was was problematic. I was advised to excise certain words from my vocabulary. So a work is not sold, it's placed. It is not a website, but an online viewing room. Fluency with art speak is a must. So you know what an art critic calls the indexical marks of an artist's body would be finger painting to most of us. I really got the sense that there was a right way Way to be around art, that if you mm-hmm. wanted to make it within this inner circle, you had to act a certain way, dress a certain way, speak a certain way. And what's interesting is like, you know, we can talk more about this whole idea of context that carries so much weight in the art world these days. But while you as a potential buyer or viewer are judging the artwork, the gallerist is judging you. And I think all of this sort of strategic snobbery, all of this kind of Gatekeeping of the schmoletariat is a way ultimately to build mystique, to keep power in the hands of the gatekeepers, and also sort of maintain the image of the art world as this exclusive purview of a self-anointed few. There's a weird way in which the art world, I think, views secrecy as key to its survival. Mm. And so as a journalist, I think that's part of the reason I was persona non grata. You know, there are things that happen in this world that would pass for absurd, unethical, illegal just about anywhere else. And if you haven't taken this mafia-like omerta vow of silence, you're viewed as a risk. Give me some examples of the absurd, unethical, and illegal. (laughs) Well, that's a great question. I'm not sure if we have time for a full airing (laughs) of all of the art world's dirty laundry. That might take more than our allotted time. But I think for me, what was particularly interesting is that I think that there's a way in which the art machine encourages us to believe that the process by which an artwork goes from being unknown to celebrated works just fine. And what I found really striking about inserting myself into this machine was understanding all of the ways that that isn't true and all the ways that it gets corrupted along the way. So, I mean, just as an example, you know, I think that I, I'd always sort of looked at museums as being these un impeachable custodians of the best that culture has to offer. Mm -hmm. And as I started selling art with galleries, I began to lose faith in that idea. I mean, I remember one afternoon during the art fairs in Miami, during Art Basel, Miami Beach, you know, we had a curator from museum guide a group of patrons around the fair, including to our booth. And at the end of that, one of these wealthy donors came back to our booth to announce that they would take two versions of the exact same photograph, one to be donated directly to the museum and one to be shipped directly to her house. And I mentioned that because it's a little bit of philanthropy, a little bit of polite corruption in the sense that, you know, the minute that an artwork goes to a museum, its price usually goes up. Mm -hmm. But I also think that, you know, curators and and institutions like to insist that money plays no role in determining the artworks that they put up for the public to view. And at the end of the day, like the work that shows up in museums 
It's just the product of decisions by individuals who are flawed and biased and subjective and operating within certain limitations, just like any of us, right? And money is one of them. And I think that while it's incredibly difficult to fix all of the flaws in the machine, we can begin to do so for ourselves by widening our art horizons. And what I mean by that is I think there's something to be gained by spending less time with quote-unquote masterpieces and more time seeking out art that is uncelebrated, undiscovered, unknown, surprising. Ultimately, you can't just believe that because something is hung in a fancy white room that it's great. At the end of the day, the only eye that you can trust is your own. And one way to develop your eye is to see more work. Well, I do want to talk a little bit later on about the journey of developing one's eye and the pleasure of adventuring and seeing art in new ways. But but let's stick on this theme of mystery or intentional obfuscation that you encountered in the art world, because I think it's fascinating. And I, I love what you were just talking about, the ways in which we think there is sort of museums or these pure spaces. And they're not because the art world is incredibly incestuous, frankly, where the <laughs> collectors and the curators and the gallerists and the artists to some extent are all sort of in bed with each other. There's a little bit of a cabal. I'm intrigued by this notion of mystery and I think it even comes down to the careers that exist in the art world, right? I was thinking about the career of gallerist, and I was thinking about how often it shows up as a job for a character in a romantic comedy because <laughs> it's sort of glamorous, but the viewer doesn't really understand what a gallerist does day to day, so they don't sort of balk at the fact that in the rom-com, the gallerist seems to be spending all their time like pursuing love and not actually working. <laughs> um, but Right. All you ever really see is someone walking out from behind a desk somewhere and gesturing vaguely at some paintings around them. Exactly. Right? And just looking hopelessly chic. But as you learned, the role of gallerist is crazy demanding, right? To tell me a little bit uh, about what you found there. When you look at what gallerists do, they play a really essential role, first of all, in the ecosystem. You know, mm -hmm. they are there scoping out artists to show. They are giving artists a public forum in which to exhibit their work. And at the same time, they are this combination of like pageant mom, cruise director, mm -hmm. informal pharmacist, and therapist. I was really interested as my first step into the art world to go work at a gallery because I felt like they touch all parts of the machine. They're working mm. with artists, they're schmoozing collectors, they're hobnobbing with curators to try and get their artists into museums, and they sort of see it and do it all. And the gallery, of course, is also there to set prices for the work, right? To start building a market for the artist. And that is a very arbitrary process you learned, isn't it? Right. I mean, wow, money begins to lose all sort of logic when you enter the art world. <laughs> But you're right. I mean, prices when it comes to art are fungible and, as one person described it to me, totally made up. At one of the galleries I worked for, their process for determining the price for a work was basically to look around at what other artists at a similar point in their career were charging for their work and go with that. By and large, galleries and artists are not determining the prices for these works by sitting down, calculating everybody's costs, and then figuring out what do they need to charge to break even or make a profit. As other galleries described it to me, they were like, you know, we, we sit around a table and basically think, huh, I think someone would pay for that. And they begin making phone calls. And if people, you know, balk at the prices, they might knock you know, a little bit off the price. Uh, if everything sells out, again, they might raise it. So value in the art world is sometimes based on aesthetics, but really more often based on these sort of arbitrary metrics. And you alluded to this earlier, this idea of context. Context is key in the emerging art world. Tell us what do art folks mean when they talk about a work's context? Great question. Key question. So many of these art connoisseurs that I was meeting spent surprisingly little time discussing the merits of the artworks themselves. Hmm. And instead they asked, where did this artist go to school? Who else owns the work? Who is he sleeping with? And that is this so-called context, right? The web of names around an artist is their context. The social capital around an artist 
is their context. And that context seemed to influence people's judgment of the work even more than the piece itself. That didn't sit well with me. I felt like context was, first of all, one more way to exclude the schmoes. And I also felt like all this emphasis on context was basically pushing me to outsource my eye to the hive mind. Hmm. Now, it wasn't until I started working as a studio assistant in artists' studios that I felt like I discovered a different way to engage with art, a way to push away the context. And I felt like something really clicked for me as I sat on their studio floors, like stretching canvases and painting backgrounds. And what it was is that I think all of the like, hushed whispering about like indexicality that goes on in galleries and museums hadn't prepared me for the blistery business of actually making art. Mm. You know, I lost patches of arm hair to a sculpture. Like I nearly like maimed myself with staple guns. I watched an artist sweating for hours over the right shade of gray. Mm -hmm. And I think we've been told for the last hundred years that what really matters about an artwork is the idea behind it. The thought trumps the thing. But an idea is not a painting. Painting is constant decision making. Hmm. And it really is this physical process. Like you are wrestling with the laws of gravity and you have to make things stick, stay, lay. And I think watching artists work really helped me understand how to savor art like an artist. And that meant slowing down. It meant examining the physical form of an artwork, and it meant paying attention to the decisions that an artist had made. I also took the advice of an artist who challenged me to, when confronted with an artwork, just notice five things in the piece. And I found mm. that was a really helpful pathway into it. So those five things don't have to be grandiose. It does not have to be, you know, this painting is a commentary on like hierarchical social relations in the aftermath of the French Revolution, right? It could just be, you know, this pink makes me want to poke it. That for me was so revealing. It was so empowering. I felt like yeah. I was finally able to engage with art on my own terms. I was able to push away the snobbery, ignore the context and see art face to face with less pretense and more mystery than I ever had before. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, Bianca will talk about what art does to our brains. Scientists and artists have both come to this conclusion that art essentially offers our brains a glitch. It is a glitch that is a gift. It is a glitch that helps our minds escape their well-worn pathways. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by Medtronic. Medtronic is dedicated to the pursuit of life-transforming healthcare technology. From artificial intelligence to robotics and beyond, health tech is reinventing what's possible. Every year, Medtronic improves the lives of 74 million people, and we're just getting started. Visit Medtronic.com to learn more. Welcome back to the show. Human beings have been making art forever. Painting is older than the written word. Paint itself is older than the wheel. But even if art has been around from time immemorial, we're still trying to find answers to questions like, what is art? And scientists are only just now coming up with answers about why our brains seek it out. Art is in many more places than we give it credit for. I also worked with an artist named uh, Amanda Alfieri, and she was an artist who um, had a very impressive resume, you know, MFA from Columbia, experience showing at the most, you know, respected arts venues in the country. And at the time that I met her, she had spent the last few years actually performing as an ass influencer on Instagram, which is to say, you know, she was an influencer who had hundreds of thousands of followers that she had gained through posting revealing photos of her butt. And I didn't know much about her work, but another artist invited me to her opening where Amanda, or Mandy Allfire, which is her online name, had invited her fans to come to the gallery for a live face sitting where she was going to sit on their faces until, and I quote, they couldn't take it anymore. 
Now, I have to confess that my initial reaction to this was, this is absurd. You know, mm-hmm. This is everything wrong with the art world. Like this is we have we've taken this too far. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I got there and um, before I knew it, she was sitting on my face. <sighs> Needless to say, I couldn't stop thinking about her work. And I think part of it was that her work raised really thorny, difficult questions around what is art. I was fascinated to discover that our idea of what art is today is really a hangover from these rather arbitrary decisions that were made by status-conscious Europeans in the 1760s who decided to elevate certain things to the realm of fine art and demote everything else to the realm of craft. So according to these Europeans in the 1760s, art was basically poetry, painting, sculpture, maybe architecture, you know, a handful of things. Mm -hmm. And these things could move our souls, they could transport us, and everything else was the sort of useful but not moving products made by, you know, sort of artisans who were inspired but useful. Right. And I think that under... Craft, right. And and I think understanding that helped me begin to see art in so many more places than I ever did before. And scientists argue that it is crucial to our survival as a species. And I would say there are a number of explanations for this, but one that particularly resonated with me is this idea that art helps us fight the reducing tendencies of our minds. Hmm. So, you know, part of the reason that context is so tempting for us to rely on is because it's basically how our brains work. We don't look at the world like video cameras dispassionately recording the scenes around us. Really, our brains are trash compactors. You know, we have these filters of expectations that descend and preemptively categorize, sort, dismiss, prioritize all this raw data coming in even before we get the full picture. You know, we are ultimately seeing this rather compressed view of the world around us, one that is already being shaped by our expectations. And scientists and artists have both come to this conclusion that art essentially offers our brains a glitch. It is Mm. a glitch that is a gift. It is a glitch that helps our minds escape their well-worn pathways. They're a bit like dreams in a sense. You know, art is not always pleasant, yeah. but it sort of reminds us that our idea of what the world is shouldn't be fixed. You know, it sort of introduces these jarring sights or experiences and in that process opens us up to experiencing so much more. Let me pause you for a sec, actually, because I want to I want to drill down on this idea that that Art is a glitch similar to a dream, right, Mm. that shakes our brain out of its complacency. And I think this partly explains something that a lot of people struggle to to quite understand about art, which is that so much of art is not beautiful. It's not pretty pictures, right? And in fact, you encountered artists who would say things to you like, beauty is my fucking nemesis. Mm. And I think it's easy to look at that and say, oh, well, that's just a form of pretension and that's just a way of signaling, you know, well, folks who are part of the art world and understand the context, understand that things that are intentionally grotesque are really where value and beauty are. But in fact, there's this interesting, which you've alluded to, maybe psychological, neurological explanation, right, for why art that is not immediately, uh, you know, that's not just a screensaver is actually art that can move us in the most profound ways, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So it's true that for the last century or so, the art world has basically treated beauty as its nemesis. And that was a bit off-putting to me. I felt like, you know, millennia of evolution had trained me to try and avoid discomfort. You know, like that was not something I was supposed to run towards. But I will say that when you think about it, our brain's run the risk of essentially like overfitting to the data that we're given about the world. And so what art can do is, is again, jostle that algorithm in our brains loose, right? Help Mm -hmm. us lift those filters of expectation. And I think one example of that that's really powerful to think about is color constancy. So color constancy is this process by which our brains essentially regulate our perception of the colors that we're seeing in the world. So imagine that you have a bowl of lemons. When you look at that bowl of lemons under basically any light, you will think, huh, 
they are yellow. And our brains will convince us that those lemons are yellow, even in cases where the light on them is causing the light waves bouncing off those lemons to be closer to the wavelength that we would typically call green. So that's mm. color constant. Color constancy is essentially our brains fiddling with the controls to ensure that like, you know, a white shirt looks white to us even when it looks purple under certain lighting conditions. Mm -hmm. Now, scientists ha have made the interesting observation that there's a particular group of people that seems very good at interrupting that color constancy process in lifting those filters of expectation to see the actual colors. And that group of people is artists. Mm. There's an amazing series of paintings by Monet of a cathedral where he paints it under different lighting conditions. At dawn, it's like this radiant poppy orange in places with butterfly wing purple in others. And I went to a fascinating talk by a neuroscientist who argued that, you know, that's not just artistic license. That is Monet interrupting color constancy. That's him lifting his mm. filters of expectation. And I got to watch artists really doing this in their studios. Julie Curtis, the artist, I remember her you know, trying to paint this gray door. And where I saw gray, she saw this incredible rainbow of lavenders and yellows and pinks and blues. I think what's exciting about using art to teach us how to fight the reducing tendencies of our minds is that it can open us up to the chaos, the nuance, and also, yes, the beauty of the world around us. And I came to think that beauty is ultimately our name for this experience that nudges us to a place where we're wondering about the world and our place mm. in it. Like beauty draws you close. Beauty inspires curiosity. Julie was obsessed with this sewage treatment plant in Brooklyn, and she, she insisted it was beautiful. And it wasn't until later when I found myself like searching it out on the skyline, wanting to write about it, like willing to do anything to go visit it, that I realized like it is beautiful. That is beauty. Beauty is this mm -hmm. thing that, again, draws us deeper into our existence and is ultimately this excited hell yes to what life has to offer. Yeah. Beauty grabs us by our lapels. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. And like shakes us a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah. I love all these details about sort of the, the, the science, the neuroscience of what we get when we look at art. And I want to talk about how you put some of those in practice a little bit. You've alluded to this. You, you got a job as a security guard at the Guggenheim. Tell me about why you wanted to do that and how that experience started to change how you actually looked with and engaged with art, how you totally shed the context bullshit um, <laughs> and saw art as, as something different, something transcendent. Well, there are a number of different reasons why I decided to become a security guard. I mean, one of them was Art people can't agree on much, but everyone that I met could basically agree that museums were the ultimate end point in this world. Like everyone mm -hmm. was sort of elbowing to get their work into a museum. And so I couldn't help but wonder, like, what went on behind the scenes? Like, what actually went down in the hushed corridors of these august institutions? And I was also very curious to know how being around art for hours on end with no possibility for escape would affect my relationship with the work. So I will tell you that initially um, the job was extremely boring. Uh, I, I, used to, I, um, you know, I remember like stepping out uh, on some of my early posts and I was like, I would just mentally beg someone to touch an artwork so I could tell them not to. And bit by bit, I began to break up the monotony in different ways. And one of the things I did was actually to give myself an exercise to look at a single artwork for the full 40 minutes of a single post. And, you know, I can tell you that the only time in my life that I had spent 40 minutes looking at a single artwork before this was never. And yet really bizarre and exciting things began to happen when I engaged in this process of slow looking. and. I took that artist's advice to just notice five things and yeah. then five more and five more. And, and I began to develop relationships with the artwork with me. And I will say that some of these relationships were a little hostile. I picked fights with certain paintings. <laughs> um, there were some works that sort of felt like the uh, visual equivalent of an annoying person sitting in the middle seat next to you on a plane. Like I was just like, okay, like, thank you. Like that's enough. But then there were works where 
I kept discovering something new after 40 minutes, after four hours, after four weeks, you know, and I felt what I could only describe as what I recognized as love for wow. these artworks, you know, this feeling that I could be around them for as long as I could envision into the future and not get sick of their presence. And I will say that there was a lot about that experience that changed my own approach to art. I think for one thing, I became convinced that we needed to ignore the wall labels. Again, that's kind of paragraph-long text um, that exists next to a lot of artworks and museums. The didactics. The didactics, thank you. Um, <laughs> to use the proper snob term. <laughs> and reading the wall text while looking at artwork is, it's you're trying to have a conversation with the work, but someone keeps interrupting. Mm. I think the wall text sort of implies that there is a single right answer to the work. You know, they sort of exist like the answer at the bottom of a word search. And in reality, there are so many fascinating ways into an artwork. You know, I, I will confess that I actually started standing to try and keep people from reading the wall text. Like I got to try and uh -huh. block it with my back. And when I did, like people's interpretations went wild. There was one piece in particular by Brancusi that I was obsessed with. And when people didn't read the wall text or, or the tombstone, which is that little description of like the, the artist's name and the title of the piece and when it was made and so on and so forth, they would see a high heel, a string of poop, a woman, a fish. I mean, you know, so many different things. And if they just read the wall text, they would look at it. The sculpture was called Miracle Parentheses Seal and say, oh, it's a seal. I knew it was a seal and move on. I found that so depressing and heart-wrenching. And I think the second thing that that experience really changed for me was I used to go to museums and believe that, like, the only way to get my money's worth was scorched earth viewing. Like, I had to mm. look at every single thing in the work in the museum. You know, that was the only way to have actually done it. Like, tick, 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 each work. And, you know, afterwards, as I started working as a guard, I began to think that was sort of like going to an all-you-can-eat buffet and chowing down on waffles and sushi and cheese fries and mimosas and then wondering why Gross. you felt a little ill at the end of it. And, you know, I think that a museum and a gallery can be a little more like an a la carte experience. Like if you go in and there's one work and you take time with that work and you have an experience and it pulls you to it and you stay there, that's it. Like you've done it. And that's not mm. to say that... We can't be better lookers. You know, there's a study that shows that people spend four times longer reading the wall text and actually looking at the piece itself, which is an average of eight seconds versus two seconds. So, you know, challenge yourself. Spend five minutes with a piece. Spend 15 minutes with this piece. Spend 50 minutes with a piece and see what happens. But also remember that just because one of these works doesn't speak to you doesn't mean that you're doing it wrong. And I, I will say the last thing is what was so exciting for me was actually stepping out of the museum each day at the end of my shift and seeing art all around me. My eyes would settle on these hot dog carts. And I was like, these are sculptures, man. You know, like there's something really exciting about looking at the everyday, the way that we look at art with this yeah. extra beat, with this willingness to kind of ask why to ponder the sort of fragility of these objects around us, the sort of miraculous impossibility of something as quotidian as, I don't know, a toothbrush. Yeah. And I think that that's really exciting, the way that art expands our appreciation for and our wonder at the everyday. And to trust our own instincts and interpretations and desires the thing about the wall text, right, is that and we see this actually in all sorts of different pieces of culture. Like it's the TV recap that you open immediately after you've watched the episode of a show that you don't understand and the critic explains it to you and you adopt that explanation. I think we have this deep discomfort uh, that the modern world has tried to alleviate through wall texts and recaps and podcasts to just explain things and to create orthodoxy and to excuse us from having to live with the discomfort of I don't know how this makes me feel. I don't understand this, but I can't look away and let me see what conclusions I can draw on my own. Absolutely. And I think that developing an eye is crucial in our day and age when we live in such a visual culture. I mean, there are 
images all around us constantly hollering for our attention. You know, they wave at us from Instagram. They scream at us from billboards. They like, I don't know, shake themselves from the frozen food aisle. And these images are not neutral, right? They are trying to influence us. They're trying to get us to do something. And so developing an eye can begin with art, but the rewards of doing so certainly don't end there. Developing an eye doesn't just help you digest the images that are coming at you in all directions. Learning to look at art can make you a better doctor, a better police officer, a better FBI agent or Navy SEAL. Bianca will explain what I'm talking about right after the break. I want to quickly tell you about the Next Big Idea Club's Book Box subscription. Every quarter, we get our friends Malcolm Gladwell, Adam Grant, Susan Cain, and Daniel Pink to pick the two best new works of nonfiction. And then we send them to our subscribers. If you sign up, you'll also get access to beautiful audio and video e-courses, invitations to exclusive AMAs with top authors, membership in our LinkedIn community, and VIP access to our live events. Plus, you'll be helping us continue to make this show. So if this is at all interesting to you, go to nextbigideaclub.com, learn more, and if you do end up subscribing, use the promo code PODCAST at checkout to get 20% off. That's nextbigideaclub.com, promo code PODCAST. I love this this anecdote in the book you give about someone named Erwin Braverman, who was a professor of medicine at, at Yale, who basically found that developing an eye for art could make you a better doctor, right? Exp- explain that anecdote to me. I think it's so oh, delightful. So glad you brought it up. I love that. So, so yes, this was a physician who also taught students, I believe, at the Yale Medical School. And he began to notice that many of his students, and even the physicians around him, were not examining their patients holistically. They were essentially sort of defaulting back to context. You know, they would look at a a few salient details, and if it fit a pattern enough, they would run with it. And so he felt like, okay, I need to figure out a way to teach my students to really examine their patients, to really get more information, take it in, and not be instantly jumping to conclusions. So he decided to try and solve this problem by actually taking his students to an art museum and teaching them how to look. What he basically did was had them go and look at artworks and describe them. And this was really Mm -hmm. an exercise in opening oneself up to sources of information, to lifting that filter of expectation. And what he found was the group of students that had gone to look at the artworks, you know, noticed more when they went back to meet with their patients. They, you know, had had richer observations. Just all kinds of great things came out of this brief encounter with art. So this actually became a mandatory part of the curriculum at, I believe, the Yale School of Medicine, but at other medical schools as well. And not only that, but it has become a program that I believe has been embraced by everyone from like FBI agents to Navy SEALs, I think you say. Yeah, Yeah, Navy SEALs. And so I think that it's just this sort of wonderful anecdote about the way that art is rewarding to any of us in basically any discipline that we pursue. And there's this whole field, too, of of neuroaesthetics that I think sort of suggests that deeply contemplating art is good for our health. It's good for our well-being. Yeah. And it's fun. And it's fun. (laughs) Okay. One one last question for you, which is, you know, you've alluded to this idea that when we see a, a work of art that confuses us, we just have to try to come up with five things about it. When that performance artist was sitting on your face, what five things did you stop, notice, and wonder about? So I will say that in that moment when darkness descended and I felt the full weight of another human 
on my face, I definitely reached for that notice five things safety blanket. And so, you know, I remember thinking, this is the darkest place I've ever been before. You know, I was like, wow, like I can hear her laughing before she laughs, right? Like I can mm. feel almost like the sort of seismic activity of a laugh before you can actually audibly hear the ha ha, right? Um, I eventually got to this place where I was like, huh, this is incredibly peaceful. You know, like there's something weirdly calming about the weight of another human over you. And I think by the end of it, like truth be told, I wouldn't have minded taking a nap. <sighs> I will confess, as I said before, that that experience with Mandy Allfire's work really left me reeling and and raised a lot of questions for me about not only what is art, but also what is good art. And like, was that piece where she sat on people's faces successful? Mm. And it wasn't until later that I began to develop a different relationship with this context of taste. You know, I had always thought of taste as a destination. Like there was a right answer. I had to have the right taste. And after working with artists, I began to see taste as instead a journey. I think a lot of us look at our tastes as something static, you know, like they are a part of our identity. We embrace them. We do not want to change them. And we sort of linger in the comfort of our tastes probably for far too long. You know, it's sort of like a warm bath and we stay there until we get pruney and the water's mm. dirty and cloudy and cold and we mm -hmm. still don't leave it. Julie, th that artist, really encouraged me to think of taste instead as this constant process of exploration. With new tastes comes a new self. And I think that opened me up to really appreciating experiences like I had with Mandy Allfire, where taste was something to be prodded, to be nudged to be challenged. And so I have had such a blast in this process of just trying to expose myself to these new experiences where I don't know what they're going to offer me. I don't know if I'm going to like them. I don't know whether it's art that I'm going to try. And I, I think there's something really exciting about treating our eye as a muscle and also treating our taste as something elastic. Can I do something like a little geeky and a little weird? Yeah, of course. I love geeky and weird. <laughs> Can I read a poem? Yes. Do you know uh, the poem, When I Heard the Learned Astronomer by Walt Whitman? No. Okay, so let me, let me read it to you. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I sitting heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical moist night air and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. Looked up in perfect silence at the stars, right? Forget the context, forget the indexicality, ignore the wall labels. Just look. Just look. I love that. Bianca Bosker, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for, for this book. Thanks for helping us learn how to see. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for that beautiful poem. <laughs> it was really embarrassing. My like heart's racing a little bit. I feel super embarrassed by it. <laughs> Bianca Bosker's new book, Get the Picture, is out now. If you enjoyed this episode, I've got kind of a fun way you could let me know. Go out into the world and snap a picture of some surprising piece of art. A hot dog stand, an advertisement, a sewage treatment plant. Send it to me at podcast at nextbigideaclub.com. And if you're one of the first five people to write in, we'll give you a free express membership to the Next Big Idea Club. That email again is podcast at nextbigideaclub.com. Today's episode was written and produced by me, Caleb Bissinger. Sound design by Mike Toda. Rufus Griscom is our executive producer. We could not make this show without the brilliant folks at the LinkedIn Podcast Network. See you next week. <laughs>